How much time does our world have? History is littered with man's failed attempts for utopia on Earth. Kingdoms crumble and empires evaporate. What is the destiny of man? How can one find personal peace? Can we know the future? Yes, we can. Throughout the scriptures, God has sent messages of hope to help us recognize our place in time and prepare for the future. Join us now as Amazing Facts presents Millennium of Prophecy with Doug Batchelor. Welcome to another evening at Millennium of Prophecy here in Manhattan Center in the illustrious metropolis of New York City. Good evening, friends from New York City and around the world. My name is John Lomakang, and those of you who are joining us for the first time, I will be your host throughout the entire series. And friends, we are so excited about what's taking place here in New York City. So now join with me this evening in New York and around the world as we welcome our speaker for the series, Doug Batchelor. Thank you, John. Welcome, everybody. God bless you. Thank you for coming back. I want to welcome our friends who are watching around the world and across North America. We are very happy and joyful here, but in reality, the things that we're sharing in this seminar are very solemn. And there is eternal importance. These issues that we're presenting are life and death issues. And so I would appeal to you to plead with and have your heart yearn over your friends to come to this program, and I guarantee it will change their lives. And now at this time, I'd like to bring out Mrs. Batchelor, who has some Bible questions that have come in, and she'll give you information on how you watching at home and around the world can participate by emailing or faxing us the various Bible questions. You look nice tonight, oh, why, dear. Thank you. Okay. Number one, please explain the scripture, two women at the mill, one taken, one left. Luke 17, 34 through 36. Okay, you remember what our last study was. T turn in your Bible to Luke 17, please. You remember in our last study, we talked about the second coming, and we learned that the rapture is going to come as a thief but it is not going to be a secret. Everybody's going to know. And that life does not continue on earth indefinitely after the rapture. Now, some people often turn to a scripture that you can find in Luke chapter 17, verse 34. And if you have that in your Bibles, I'm always tempted to give out the page number, but I know that we all have different page numbers. And, and uh, so, Luke 17, verse 34. I tell you that in that night, there shall be two men in one bed. One will be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken, the other left. Two men shall be in the field. One shall be taken, the other left. In verse 30, 37 it says, And they said to him, Where, Lord? He said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither or there will the vultures, the eagles, be gathered together. Now this is a scripture that's often been used to paint a picture that just before the coming of Jesus, you've got two women that are grinding bread out of stone, you know, they're grinding out their flour, and poof, one of them is caught up, and the other one's left behind waving goodbye. Or there are two men sleeping in the bed, and one man wakes up and says to his brother, hey, what happened? Where'd he go? Or two men are out uh, harvesting in the field, and one just disappears, and then the other keeps on harvesting. That's not what it's talking about. Remember, the Bible uses very powerful symbols to teach points, and especially in the parables of Jesus. All right, let me ask you. What is the harvest field a symbol of biblically? Some of you know, some of you this may be new. What does the harvest field represent? You remember what Jesus said? The harvest is great, the labors are few, the harvest, the field is the world. There are two kinds of people spreading two kinds of truth out there, the true and the false, two kinds of missions going on. One is right, one is wrong. What is sleep a symbol of biblically? Death. Death. Remember, Jesus said, our friend Lazarus sleepeth. The Bible says that uh, Stephen gave up the spirit and went to sleep. And sleep. King David slept with his fathers. How many kinds of people asleep now? We learned in our last study there's two resurrections. We get the dead in Christ and the lost, okay? Those who will be saved, those who, the Bible says, have done good, the resurrection of life. Those that have done evil, the resurrection of damnation. Two men sleeping. One is going to make it, one is not. 
Now, what does a woman represent prophetically? Church. You know that. Yeah, it's all through the Bible. The Bible says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church. church. And when you get to Revelation, you need to know that a woman represents a church. In Revelation, they've got two women. Now, one is good, one is bad. Revelation 12, good woman. Revelation 17, bad. We'll talk about that in another study. What does bread represent? Remember we studied this? The Bible. the Bible. Two women grinding out the word. One is true, one is false. One is saved, one is lost. So what J Jesus is telling us is not that suddenly man and his wife are going to walk down the street and the uh, husband disappears or the wife disappears because one's been taken and life is going to go on for another seven years. I don't believe that's biblical. That is incidentally a new teaching that was developed by a couple of Jesuit priests, one of them by the name of Francisco Rivera, and I respectfully disagree. Uh, the traditional theology for years has been the coming of Jesus is going to be a literal, visible event, and it, it is going to mark the climax of the great controversy, Amen. the end of sin Amen. and sinners. Amen. And so the idea that there's going to be a second chance, the devil loves that theology, but it's very dangerous. Two women, two churches, two men sleeping, two kinds of people dead, two men out working in the field, two kinds of work going on. That's what Jesus is saying. He's not saying that all of a sudden planes are going to crash because the pilot was taken. Have you heard these things before? And I don't... If, if I share something that is new or you disagree with, we can still love and learn from each other. Amen? I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I used to belong to a fellowship that believed that. The more I studied it, I said, I can't find it in the Bible. You know, I told you I have a Bible answer program every Sunday night, a national program. I did it from here last Sunday. People call me and they say, Brother Doug, we're trying to find some scriptures to share the idea about the seven years after the rapture that life goes on here on earth. I said, I can't help you. They're not there. They said, well, we're glad to hear that because we can't find them. <laughs> it's in the songs and they're making movies and they're writing books, but it's not in the Bible. Mm -hmm. So if you have more questions, ask me about that. Okay. Will we recognize each other in heaven? Will we recognize each other in heaven? I get that question a lot. And the reason for that the Bible's very clear, we have new bodies. And when grandma comes out of the grave and she died 90 years old, is she gonna look like wrinkled grandma? No, she's gonna have her glorified body. And people say, well, I'm not gonna recognize grandma. I always knew her with her wrinkles. No, do you think that when we get into the kingdom that our senses and our perception are gonna be diminished or enhanced? Of course we're going to know each other. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, I think it's verse 12, says, Then I will know even as I am known. Of course we'll know each other. That's good news. Yeah, we'd okay. be wandering around looking for one another. Where is the Garden of Eden located? Well, the Garden of Eden biblically was located in the area around Mesopotamia, what we think of now. Remember it says there were four rivers. Two of them are still modern rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates, which are over there by Iraq. But we have reason to believe, many Bible commentators believe, that the Garden of Eden may have been raptured up to heaven. You think, wait, Doug, that sounds pretty wild. Have you read in, in uh, Revelation where it says the New Jerusalem is coming down, and in the New Jerusalem is the Tree of Life? Amen. Well, if God can make a city go down, He can make a garden go up. Amen. And you remember, God made the whole world, but He says the garden was planted by Him. There was special care in that garden, and I think before the flood, I agree with the commentators that say it was assumed up to heaven, and it will be in the New Jerusalem. It will be the Central Park, if you will, in the New Jerusalem when it descends from God out of heaven, right? Amen. So that's going to be really exciting. Okay. Are the seven last plagues literal? The seven last plagues that you find in Revelation chapter 15, 16, are they literal plagues? I believe we have every reason to think they are. Were the plagues that came on the Egyptians in the Old Testament real plagues? Yeah, so we have reason to believe that these are real plagues too. Incidentally, the Great Tribulation and the seven last plagues are synonymous. They fall at the same time. Does the Bible teach against cremation? Is there a teaching in the Bible against cremation? Not specifically. You know, most of the times in the Bible it tells us that the deceased were, especially God's people, were buried. Um, there are a couple of exceptions. King Saul, whose body was mutilated by the Philistines, and his son Jonathan and, the, and his brothers, their bodies, David had them cremated. And um, some people get a little bit worried about being cremated, and some people are worried about being buried in a box. My brother died, and he said, please don't put me in a box. Make sure I'm cremated. He had cystic fibrosis. And uh, 
Think about it, friends. If you're buried, especially as people were buried hundreds of years ago, unless you've been specially mummified, ashes unto ashes and dust unto dust, eventually it turns back into the elements of the earth. You decompose into fertilizer. If you are cremated, you're simply accelerating the process. Some people are afraid of cremation because they think that when God comes back for the resurrection, if the person's in a casket, he's going to say, I can deal with this, and he's going to raise them. But if they've been cremated and they spread the ashes over the water, the Lord's going to say, I can't find the parts. I'm not going to be able to put them back together again. You underestimate God for one thing. And for the second thing, God is not using the old parts, praise the Lord. I'm trading this one in on a newer model, right? So he may come back to the spot where you were laid to rest and come back to the world, but he doesn't have to go gather up the fragments and try and reassemble them, right? Amen. He was able to breathe life into Adam from the dust of the earth. So don't worry. Uh, I've told Karen, just find out what the best discounts are and go for that if I go before her. I'm going to just use our backhoe and I've dig a said, hole. Yeah, there you go. I said, uh, give any parts that are still safe to science. I really believe that. Amen. Because, you know, if you can use part of your eyes, your bodies, or something to help others live, that's a Christian philosophy. I agree. Okay, where does the Bible say Daniel was a eunuch? Well, the Bible does not say Daniel was a eunuch, but we have strong evidence that he was. For one thing, it says Daniel, does everyone here know what a eunuch is? So I remember I first read the Bible, I had no idea what that was. I remember I was in a cave too and I dropped out of high school. <laughs> but first time I read that, I what's a eunuch? I thought that meant unique. <laughs> and in that sense, it is true. <laughs> but uh, a eunuch was a man who had been uh, demasculated because he lived in the palace where the king's harem was. And the king wanted to make sure that his mind was on the king's business. And it was typical in the ancient civilizations for the king's wise men and counselors who stood in his presence and they had access to the palace where the harem was, they were uh, castrated they were, and they were eunuchs. The Bible says Daniel was committed to the care of the prince of the eunuchs. Well, that ought to tell you something. Not only that, I think if you read in Isaiah chapter 39, it tells you that Hezekiah was told by Isaiah, some of your sons will be carried away captive and made eunuchs in the palace of Babylon. Mm -hmm. So we do have reason to believe Daniel. You never read about Mrs. Daniel or Daniel's children. Okay. That's enough evidence. That's enough. Our last question. Do all dreams come from God? Uh, no. Uh, you can read, I think, in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 3, a dream comes through the multitude of business. Uh, now, some dreams, dreams come from three things. Some dreams come from God. Uh, some dreams come from uh, the multitude of business. In other words, uh, I remember I used to snow ski. I went to a school in Maine when I lived here in New York City, went to a boarding school in Maine where we would snow ski all winter, and I ski several times a day, and at night, what do you think I was doing? <laughs> all night long. Then I went through a stage in my life where I played a lot of chess, and there's something about what the optical impression of staring at a checkered board for hours and hours, and I went to sleep at night. What do you think I saw? Checkered board, of chess pieces everywhere, because whatever you fill your mind with, you're liable to dream about. And if you don't eat right and eat too late, you're liable to have some wild dreams, too. <laughs> and dreams can not only be inspired from the Lord and the multitude of business, things you've filled your head with, as Solomon said, and not eating right, they can be inspired by the devil. Anyone ever have a nightmare? And so God does speak through dreams. There's several ways it can happen, but they don't all come from God. Thank you very much for your questions. If we didn't get to your question, don't give up on us. Write it down for us here in the Manhattan audience. Email us or call us and let us know. We'll do our best to cover as many as possible. Did you do your lesson? Do you have your lessons tonight? It's a really interesting story tonight dealing with the subject of the rebellious prince. And it's going to help us to uh, understand something about why is there sin in the world? And if God is love, why did he make a devil? Did he make a devil? And a number of these questions will be addressed. Now, I don't want the ladies to jump up and run, but we have an amazing fact tonight that uh, deals with scorpions. Scorpions are kind of a strange creature. They have those lobster-like claws, and uh, they look like they uh, aren't related to anything else, but actually they're in the arachnid or spider family. They're unusual for a number of reasons. Do you know that if you have a dark room, 
scorpions are on the floor, you can turn on an ultraviolet light and they will shine. They have a fluorescence in their skin that makes them glow. Kind of gives you the creeps to think about that, doesn't it? Most cases, the sting of scorpions, there's 1,400 varieties, is not fatal. Though there are some varieties in North America that children have died from. Our son Daniel was playing in a sandbox in the backyard one day and he screamed and we ran out and scorpion bit him two or three times, crawled underneath his shirt there in Texas. But it was not any worse than a bee sting. But scorpions are, they're kind of uh, ruthless creatures in that they are vengeful, suicidal, and cannibalistic. Not too many people want them for pets unless they're uh, preoccupied with the macabre. One man did an experiment where he took a hundred scorpions and he put them in a glass jar and a couple of days later there were only 14 left. They had killed and eaten the remainder. Same person did an experiment where he took a pregnant female, put her inside a jar and she devoured her children as fast as they were born. Except one got away, crawled up on her back and a little while later then killed her. I understand a scorpion, if you corner it where there's no way of escape, will use its flexible stinger, which is actually on the end of its abdomen, and kill itself. You know, the Bible tells us that the devil knows that his time is short. Revelation chapter 12. He's come down with great wrath, and he is going to try to take as many with him as he can on his way out. Our story tonight is found in the first book of Samuel. It's actually 2 Samuel dealing with a young man by the name of Absalom. The name Absalom means Abba Shalom, or son of peace. Remember I told you Shalom, of course, means peace in Hebrew. Jeru Shalom, a city of peace. Absalom had a really good name. Now David had many sons. Absalom was the second born, but he was very striking. Had a handsome father in King David, and his mother was a princess, beautiful mother. And the Bible tells us that from the crown of his head, to the sole of the foot, there was absolutely no blemish in Absalom. He was a beautiful person. He got 50 chariots. No, I'm sorry, he got 50 men to run before him as he had a chariot and uh, so that he could start to get uh, some prestige. He killed his older brother Amnon, who was in line to rule, so he would be next in line. And then it told, tells us that he did a little bit of political campaigning and he went and the people who were coming to the city of Jerusalem to have judgment from King David, Absalom would intercept them. And he'd say, you know, David's awful busy now and he's depressed, he's had some problems in the kingdom, but you know, if I was in charge, I'd take care of you and I would give you justice and they'd bow down before him to worship him, but he'd lift them up and he'd hug them and he was so handsome and winsome. The Bible tells us he stole the hearts of the men of Israel. Finally, it broke into an open revolt. He, unprovoked, rebelled against his own father, tried to kill good King David, his own father, and take the throne by force. He wanted the power. He wanted to be king. Well, David's loyal men, his soldiers that had fought with him for many years, they stayed with him as David fled from Jerusalem. And eventually Absalom and David's soldiers were engaged in battle, and David's men were well seasoned, even though they were greatly outnumbered. Pretty soon Absalom's forces were overwhelmed and fleeing for their lives. And as Absalom rode through a thick forest on his royal white mule, it says he met the servants of David and he rode on a mule and the mule went under the thick boughs of a great terebinth tree. It's like an oak. And his head caught in the terebinth, so he was left hanging between heaven and earth. And at that point, mule ran out and there he was hanging. And he hung there for a little while until pretty soon David's soldiers found him they plunged three spears into his heart, three darts, and he was executed. They then took Absalom and they placed him in a great pit in the ground, covered him with stones that he would not have a marked grave and nobody would remember him because everyone was so disgusted with what he had done against David, who had done nothing wrong. David loved Absalom. And as we go on later with our story, you'll find out how it wounded David when he found out that his son was dead. We need to go on now with question number one in our lesson. What was the name of the rebellious prince in heaven and why did he rebel? Answer, Isaiah 12, I'm sorry, Isaiah 14, verse 12. Say the answers with me. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? 
Now, Lucifer is a name we typically think of for the devil. It's a good name. It's a name that he had from God. It was his original name before he fell. That's where you get the word like luminescence, lucite. It's, it means uh, illumination. I remember I was uh, doing a meeting like this in a small town one day, and Karen wasn't with me. I had to go do my own laundry. And while I was waiting for my clothes to dry, I saw a little boy was playing with his toy cars there on the linoleum, and I said, ah, you know, hi, how you doing? What's your name? And he looked up and said, Lucifer. <laughs> I said, so you don't go to church, do you? <laughs> you know, technically there's nothing wrong with the name, but I, I wouldn't pick it on for one of my kids. Now we typically think of for the devil as Satan. The word Satan means adversary, but that was his name back then. Then you look at Isaiah 14, verse 13 and 14. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will be like the Most High. And you go on and read that passage. He says, I, 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 five times. You know, I understand people in mental asylums use the words, I, me, my, mine, and myself ten times more than people who are sane. Selfishness is synonymous with sin, and it's a form of insanity. Lucifer became preoccupied with his position and what he wanted to do. Next part of the answer, Ezekiel 28, verse 17, Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. He was a brilliant creature, a beautiful creature, like Absalom, no blemish. He was the highest of God's angels, the leader of the angels, leader of the heavenly choir. God made him perfect, and you're thinking, no, wait, wait, Doug, something must have been wrong with the wiring. We'll get to that in just a minute, but I want you to know that Lucifer was a beautiful and a good angel. And if you knew him back then as he came from the hands of the Creator, you would have liked him too. A lot of people like him today the way he is now, and that's too bad especially around Halloween. <laughs> but he was a beautiful creature, and he became preoccupied with his own charisma, his own beauty. And it went to his head, the adoration the other angels gave him. And you know, compliments are nice, but you can take it too far where it's not healthy. You know, in Proverbs it says, do not set a net before your neighbor's feet with flattery. You can make a person stumble. Now, I have a theory that everybody can be beautiful. I really believe that. I believe everybody can be beautiful. A lot of us are insecure about our appearance. I refuse to get a toupee. I'm not going to do that. No way. I feel absolutely normal like this. This is not a birth defect. <laughs> but a lot of people are very insecure about their appearance. And I think part of the, and I'm not criticizing those of you who might respectfully disagree with my point on that. But because of Hollywood and because of the movies and the film industry and the magazines, one out of a thousand people is strikingly beautiful. But they take those people and they photograph them and they multiply the pictures and they put them on the camera and they put them on the screen and everybody sees them and we start feeling insecure if we don't all look like these perfect Barbie dolls. Most of us kind of look okie dokie, you know, we're, we're okay. <laughs> but people are insecure about their appearance. Well, I heard a pastor say something one time. He said, there's four kinds of people. He said, you got some people who are beautiful, ugly. And what he meant by that was that there are some people who maybe have a homely, average appearance, but they're beautiful on the inside. They've got a winning disposition and a quick smile, and people are attracted to them, and they're positive. They're beautiful people. Then you've got people who are ugly, beautiful. They, of course, are some of the people who might have a really nice appearance on the outside, but they're so self-absorbed and vain, they know it, and they're preoccupied with their appearance. Uh, it's, you know, you might want to be seen with them, but you wouldn't want to be married to them because they can become very difficult people. What do you think? I knew this one girl one time, very attractive girl, and every time I saw her, she was reading Glamour magazine. Whenever she'd walk by a store window, she's always checking herself in the window. <laughs> Just, it was a sickness, really. It was very sad. Preoccupied, because you know what? That doesn't last, as uh, we all discover eventually. Then you've got people who are the best. They're the beautiful, beautiful, very rare people who are beautiful on the outside and beautiful on the inside. Incidentally, do you know that Solomon says in Proverbs that a beautiful woman without discretion or a beautiful heart 
is like a jewel of gold in a pig's nose. <laughs> in other words, it's wasted beauty. But some people are beautiful on the outside and beautiful on the inside. And you realize, of course, there's no excuse for anybody to be in that fourth category, which is ugly, ugly. Right? <laughs> okay. All right, where am I? Number two. Did God make a devil when he created Lucifer? No, God made a beautiful angel. The answer is Ezekiel 28, verse 15. Thou wast perfect in, thy, in the day that thou wast created until iniquity was found in thee. God made a perfect angel. Now, I need to stop right here and clear up a very popular misconception. And that is this notion that the devil, Satan, is this grotesque, hideous beast. Now, if I were to tell you right now, all right, everybody, close your eyes. You've got a mental screen. I want you to envision the devil for a second. Don't do it too long. What do you see? Most people see, what color is his leotards? Red leotards. See, you all know that. Red leotards, and does he have a goatee? Yeah, you know, I used to have a goatee, and I was doing these meetings, and people said, you look like the devil. I shaved in a big hurry. Because even though I, there's nothing that says the devil has a goatee, it was just a bad stumbling block for some people. And he's got the horns, and he's got the bat wings, and the hooves, and, the, and he's got the pitchfork so he can make sure people are evenly cooked in hell and you know, prod people along, you know. And all these images that we've got about the devil, he wants you to think that's how he looks, but that's not what we find in the Bible. <laughs> One thing I want you to know is it's not a joke. You need to understand that he was a beautiful and a glorious angel, very attractive. He wants people to think that he's grotesque. But in fact, he was the most beautiful of the angels, and he still retains a great percentage of that beauty. Question number three, what finally happened? Well, you can read it in your Bibles. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, and it's hard to believe. It says, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels. Now, I think you know who the dragon is. It tells you right there in Revelation 12. That old serpent called the devil and Satan. That's who the dragon is. You don't have to guess. There was some cosmic conflict. I don't know what the weapons were. But eventually, Lucifer incited an all-out rebellion against God's government. You see, the way we piece it together from the few scriptures that you find in the Bible is Lucifer wanted God's position. He, somewhere within himself, began to think, how come I am not part of the inner circle of the Father, Son, and Spirit? How, how come I don't have the creative powers? I mean, I'm just underneath God. Why can't I make that one little step and transition from being a created creature to being divine? And he, the more he thought about this, he began to covet the position that God held until he began to circulate among the other angels and start to uh, plant seeds of doubt about God's government. You know, have you noticed that God made us where he's in charge and we never get a chance to be God? He says, I set the rules and you just obey. And little by little, subtly, he did what Absalom did. He campaigned behind the scenes in an insidious way until he began to ferment among the angels distrust of God. Now, you might be thinking, how could angels fall for that? Follow me, friends. Up to this point in the universe, there had never, ever been a lie. If you've never heard a lie, you know, I remember some of the immigrants who came to New York City. Some of the uh, con artists were selling them the Brooklyn Bridge. You all know that joke. It really did supposedly happen. I've got a title to the Brooklyn Bridge. I can't take care of it anymore. Here, you want to buy it? $50. And, and these people growing up in godly families, very sincere, said, oh, just tell him he's got the Brooklyn Bridge. And they fell for it because they were used to honesty. The angels had not been accustomed to resisting deception. So many of them believed it until it finally broke into an all-out war in heaven, and Satan and his followers who were rejected were evicted, you might say. Number four, what powerful beings work under the devil's command? The answer is found in Revelation 12, verse 4. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth, Revelation 12, 9 tells us, the second part of the answer, he was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Now, we hear about ghosts and we hear about demons, but you know what they actually are. They are the representatives of the devil who fell, fallen angels. 
You've heard the expression before, the devil made me do it, I was tempted, and the devil made me do it. You know what I'm talking about? Quite frankly, the devil cannot make you sin unless you are demon-possessed. God gives us a free choice. We must choose to sin. And most of the time when we are tempted, it's not the devil tempting us. It's actually Satan's representatives, demons, fallen angels. God has guardian angels. I believe very much in angels. They're in this room right now, God's angels. I think the devil's got angels probably trying to distract people. And before each meeting, I pray that God's angels will evict the devil's angels so that you'll hear what I'm saying to you. And those of you watching at home, it's still true. The devil is constantly battling with his forces to win over uh, God's children. I'll get to the reason for that in a minute. Some of you might be thinking, well, obviously, Doug, since God is perfect and God knows all things, God must have deliberately wired Lucifer wrong when the chip came out of his factory or something like that, and, and there was, God made a mistake. People say that. And Lucifer, God knew it was going to happen. Why didn't he just, uh, you say, you know, quality control, we made a mistake, send him back. Why did he allow him to carry out those selfish thoughts of rebellion? Let me establish something that is critical to your understanding the great controversy in the Bible between good and evil. God is love. Amen. He wants us to love Him. Amen. Love must be freely given. Amen. It cannot be compelled. That means God creates all of His intelligent creatures with the greatest of gifts. It's called choice. You have a free will. Now, if you're like me, you want love. How many of you want love? That's normally, if you didn't raise your hand, I don't believe you. Everybody wants to be loved. Uh, I like to be loved. And so I've come to a solution. I'm going to see if I can patent this and sell it down there on the streets in front of 34th Street, how we can all have our self-esteem elevated. Good evening, Doug. Good evening, tape player. How are you feeling this fine evening? I'm fine. How about you? I'm feeling rather peppy. I have a new batteries. Congratulations. Doug, I need to tell you something. We're all listening. I love you, Doug. No, please listen. I love the way your head shines. I mean, your light shines. You're so kind and wonderful and generous and tall and dark and handsome. I love you, Doug. I love you, Doug. Doug, I love you. I love you, Doug. I love you, Doug. I love you. I love you, Doug. I love you, Doug. Doug, I love you. I love you, Doug. But Doug, I love you. No, wait, I love you. I love you. I love you, Doug. I feel so much better now. <laughs> Do you think I really feel better? <laughs> you know why it doesn't mean anything to me? I made this tape in my image. <laughs> it's just doing what I told it to do. It's pre-programmed. That's not love, is it? Now, some people are saying if God is all-knowing, how, how come he took the risk of making a creature with this possibility that he'd rebel? How many of you are parents? Pass up, come on. How many of you got a written guarantee before you co procreated that your children would cooperate and never disobey you? Any of you get that written statement? How many of you recognized you were taking a risk that they may not obey? How many of you had no idea and you were shocked later? You thought, because I love them so much, they're going to just do everything I tell them to do, right? Ignorance is bliss. <laughs> you take a risk when you want to love. You have to give freedom. And sometimes it, love is very painful. Some people get hurt in love, and they're afraid to ever love again because you take a risk of getting hurt. God took that risk when he made our world and when he made all the creatures. He wanted us to love him freely. Question number five. What methods does Satan use in his work of deception? Now, we got several answers here, and I want you at home to say them out loud also. Here we go. Revelation 12, 9, Satan which deceiveth the whole world. Now, are you aware the devil has some advantages over God? Yeah. In the battle between good and evil, God can only use truth. The devil can use any combination of truth or error. He can mix them up any way he wants. As a matter of fact, the reason there are so many different churches and so much religious confusion in the world is because I believe all churches have different percentages of truth. That's what makes them attractive. If you're going fishing 
You find out what the fish like, and you take their favorite food, and you put it in the water with a hook in it. Hook doesn't have to be very big, but you give them something perfectly healthy without the hook. If I were to say, look, I've got a glass of water here for you. It is pure water, store-bought, sealed water. I've just added one little drop, 1% strychnine. Help yourself. It's 99% good, but what does that 1% poison do? Makes the whole thing lethal. And the devil knows that principle, and that's why there's so much relig religious confusion in the world. So he deceives. And the Bible says he's deceiving the whole world. A lot of the world is deceived about the devil. He, they're distracted. Well, all right, I better keep going here. Answer B, Mark chapter 1, verse 13. Jesus was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan. Christ was tempted by the devil. Incidentally, is it a sin to be tempted? No. no. Jesus was tempted. Matter of fact, some of you think, oh, I'm never tempted. If you tell me you're never tempted, you're in big trouble. That means you're making no effort to resist. You're just bobbing on downstream on your way to destruction, and you say, this is great, I don't get tempted. But if you try to resist the devil and you're swimming upstream against the current, you're going to feel the battle raging. Matter of fact, one of the first things that happens when a person makes an effort to do God's will is they feel resistance. It's because they've just been floating on their way down to the precipice of eternity. This, this is great. No resistance. Actually, it isn't great. I, I've been on that uh, river before. Answer C, Revelation 16, 14, for they are the spirits of devils working miracles. One of the ways that Satan deceives, he uses miracles. Can you remember a story in the Bible where Moses went before the Pharaoh and Pharaoh said, prove that you've come from God. And he took his rod, he threw it down, it turned into a serpent. Pharaoh clapped his hands and out came his magicians and they threw down their staffs, their rods, and they turned into serpents too. Can the devil do miracles, work signs and wonders? Yes. Are we to believe because some religion or some ministry says, but we heal, we do miracles, it must be from God? Can the devil counterfeit miracles? Yes. yes. So we need to be very careful not to make that the criteria. When you read on in Revelation, you're going to find it says that the devil does great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men to deceive them. The diabolical miracles will increase as time goes on. So you're going to have to go by what the Bible says and not by what your senses tell you. Furthermore, we read about the devil, Revelation chapter 10, 12 verse 10 rather. It says, he is the accuser of our brethren who is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. If you've read the story of Job, the devil comes before the Lord and accuses Job. Oh, the only reason he obeys you is you're protecting him. Take away your protection. You read in the book of Zechariah how the devil accuses Joshua the high priest. And you know, the devil is so rotten. He will tell you to do something wrong, and then he will turn you in for doing it. I had some friends in school who used to do that. They said, I dare you to go kick the emblem off the teacher's car. I said, I'm not afraid, and I do it. And she'd say, who did this? Doug did it. They'd tell me to do it, and then they'd turn me in. Diabolical. Furthermore, we learn, answer E, that he, he manipulates. The devil will promise people fame and fortune if they will worship him, but they can't control themselves. They end up becoming addicts and pawns and puppets of the prince of darkness. Now I want to get to answer E. It tells us that he was a murderer from the beginning, for he is a liar and the father of it. Back in the beginning when Cain killed his brother Abel, who do you think inspired that? You know, up until the time of the cross, I think that Satan still had the sympathy of some of the unfallen angels. But at the cross, you could see clearly demonstrated Satan's love for power and Christ's power of love. At the cross, you've got the mob mocking and spitting and, and crucifying and torturing. And then you've got Jesus saying, Father, forgive them. What a contrast, the power of love and the love for power. And those two forces are battling in the world today. God is using the power of love to try and redeem and save people, and the devil is preoccupying people with the love of power. Number six, when is the devil the most dangerous? 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14 and 15. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. He looks so good. 
You know, it's one thing to be frightened of the devil when he's like a lion and jump when he's like a snake, but he's especially insidious when he appeals, appears as an angel of light. You can read in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are what? Ravening wolves. And it's always been the case that the devil plants his representatives in among the genuine. He counterfeits the, the uh, false and he incorporates it into the true to deceive people. He is a wolf in sheep's clothing. And I'll tell you, friends, Jesus, when we studied the uh, second coming the other night, Christ said, beware. First thing Jesus said when the disciples asked about the last days, the first thing he said, Matthew 24, take heed. Many, many will come in my name saying I'm Christ and deceive many. Many false prophets will arise. In other words, there are just oogles and reams of counterfeits floating around out there that are interested in usually promoting themselves. Number seven, does the devil know the Bible? Yes. What do you think? I hate to admit it, he knows it better than me. He's got a photographic memory probably. He knows it better than you. He knows it in almost every language. Some people think that uh, the Bible is a good luck charm, a relic that they can own and they don't have to be afraid. Let's read our answer. Matthew chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. Then the devil said unto Jesus, If thou be the Son of God, you know God uses faith, the devil says if. She said, if you believe, all things are possible. That's what exposed him. Some people think when the devil came to Jesus in the wilderness, he plopped down on the ground with his red leotards and his bat wings, and he said, here, I'm going to tempt you. You ready? <laughs> Would you do anything that a hideous creature like that tried to tempt you to do? No, he said, you're the devil. I know you. Right? But no, the devil looked like an angel of light, but he betrayed who he was because he said, if you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread. And Jesus met it with, a, uh, with uh, it is written. But the devil also said, cast yourself down, for it is written. He'll give his angels charge concerning thee. He quoted from the Psalms, but you know what he did? He misquoted. He only quoted part of the scripture. And he's very good at that, taking scripture and tearing it from its context and twisting its meaning to confuse people. And get folks to commit mass suicide and say they're using the Bible to prove their point. I remember I watched too much TV as a kid, and I used to see these vampire movies and um, where you could take a cross and hold up a cross, and the vampires would run because of the cross, the image of the cross. Some people think the Bible's like that. All they've got to do is own one and hold it out against the devil, and the devil's going to run from you. I've got news for you. He'll snatch it out of your hand and read it to you. <laughs> Some people think there's virtue in owning a Bible. You'd be surprised. A lot of people, we have a Bible. Do you know what it says? God helps those that help themselves. That's not in the Bible. You'd be surprised how much biblical ignorance there is. And people think that you had five of them, that means you're very holy. Or I sleep with it under my pillow. Like, you know, hanging across from the mirror in your car so you can drive drunk. They think it's a good luck charm or something. No, it's not. He's only afraid when the Bible is not under your head, but when it's in your head. Thy word I have hid in my heart, not on my shelf, that I might not sin. And so that's where it needs to be to keep us safe. Question number eight. Whom on earth does the devil hate the most? See the answer with me. Revelation 12, verse 17. And the dragon. Who's the dragon? Satan. Satan. The dragon was wroth, that means furious, with the woman. Now what did we learn a woman represents? Church. Now is this a good woman or a bad woman? Good. You know how we know it's a good woman? If the devil's mad at her, she's the right woman. She's a good woman, right? <laughs> and the dragon was wroth with the woman, and he goes to make war with the remnant. That means the remainder of her seed. Incidentally, you want to know about the Battle of Armageddon? A lot of confusion in the world. People think the Battle of Armageddon is China and Russia and the U.S. and all these things. The Battle of Armageddon is a religious war. Those are the worst kind. That's what's so fierce over there in Yugoslavia and Bosnia. It's because it's a religious war. The battle of Armageddon is going to be between those who worship the dragon and those who worship the Lord. This is the war, and we'll get to this also in Revelation. And he goes to make war with a remnant or remainder of her seed that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. She and her descendants have the law and the prophets, the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. You look in Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, Write that down. You'll find out the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. 
Remember, we learned the Law and the Prophets is another phrase for the Word of God in the Bible. Number nine, I like this question. What two deadly animals does the Bible use to portray Satan? 1 Peter 5.8, be sober, be vigilant, be awake, be alert, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion is going around seeking whom he might devour. Now, why is a lion significant? Lions use diversionary tactics to get their prey. You know, the male lion very seldom brings home the bacon, pardon the pun. Usually it's the females that do the shopping. The male lion will see a large herd of zebra, a gazelle, or something like that, and he'll go up where they can smell them in the breeze, and he'll be visible, and he'll take a chest full of air and let out this blood-curdling roar, and they all go, ah, and they jump right off into the mouths of the females. He's got them looking that way, and they run into the jaws of death. Diversionary tactics. The devil is a master at it. Sometimes he uses baseball to preoccupy people. Well, nothing personal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I'm kind of interested in may New York prosper. <laughs> but when you really think about the scope of eternity, I mean, here we're having a seminar telling people how to resist the devil and how to live forever, and grown people are preoccupied with men running around on a green field with sticks hitting a little white ball <laughs> to see who can hit it and catch it the best, right? In the scope of things, that can be a diversionary uh, a diversionary tactic for what the real priorities of life are, of seeking first God's kingdom and his righteousness. So he uses anything he can think of, even some of the harmless things, to distract us from the priorities. That's like a lion. He's also like what other creature? And the dragon, it says, was cast out that old serpent called the devil and Satan. Well, you know, many times in the Bible, you'll find that Satan is symbolized by a serpent. You know where that comes from? Back in the Garden of Eden. Incidentally, how did the devil set up his headquarters here in our planet? You know, he went throughout the universe trying to find a home. When he came to this world, God said, do not eat the forbidden fruit, you'll be okay. The devil said, don't listen to God, eat the fruit. And you know what he said? He gave them the same temptation that appealed to him. He said, eat it, and you'll be like God which is what he wanted. And incidentally, many religions in their theology have the same deception. You are God. You can be like God. Well, the Bible tells us that there is only one God, and we're to worship him. And for us to want to be God, that's where Adam and Eve fell, and that's where many fall today. A lot of false religions entice people by saying, you may not know it, but you're God. And you'd think that even if you're a little God, you'd be smart enough to recognize it. Nobody would have to come up and say, you may not know this, but you're a God. Someone's got to tell you you're not a very omniscient God, are you? <laughs> but he said, disobey God and listen to me. And Adam and Eve chose to listen to the devil instead of the word of God. You get that? They rejected the word of God. They listened to the devil, and he set up his office on this planet. As a result, this planet, Paul tells us in the New Testament, has become a theater to the universe. This planet has become a stage where this great cosmic controversy between good and evil is being acted out. And the good news is the curtain's about to come down. Amen. The play is almost over. Amen. And you can be on the winning team if you want to. And I hope you'll make that decision. How many of you remember when it says in Mark 16, speaking to the disciples, one of the signs that would follow them, it says, you'll take up serpents. You remember reading that in the Bible? Do you know there are some churches who think they're supposed to go on snake hunts and find snakes and pick them up and prove they've got the Holy Spirit? I respectfully disagree. Jesus said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. That's not how you prove you've got the Holy Spirit. Paul, when he was gathering wood after a shipwreck to help warm some people by the fire, a snake bit him. He took up the snake, shook it off in the fire, and he was not harmed. That's a symbol of, if we've got the Spirit of God, the venom of the devil will not kill us. Amen. It's not saying you've got to go look for snakes and prove you've got the Spirit by handling snakes. It's a very dangerous... I wouldn't feel comfortable being part of that religion, I'll tell you right now. Why is the devil so busy? Why is he preoccupied with hurting humans? You and I, in our own strength, we're no threat for the devil. Let me tell you what's at stake here. Satan hates Jesus. Satan hates God. He wants to exact as much suffering from God as he possibly can. If you doubt that, you read in your Bible the scenes surrounding the cross. And the devil doesn't understand it, but he knows how much the Lord loves you. 
And he knows the best way to hurt God is by hurting you. If you're a parent, you know what it is to watch your children suffer. What would hurt you more if somebody held you down and tortured you, flayed off your skin, or put bamboo shoots under your fingernails, took away the remote control? If he did something to torture you, or to have your child tortured in front of you, what would hurt more? I've watched my children suffer before, and it's, I've thought, oh, if I could change places with them. And the devil wants to hurt God by hurting us. That's why he fools with you and me. Number 10, what's the only way that we can effectively resist Satan? Answer, James 4. Submit. It says, submit yourself therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. When you submit to God and you give your life to him, you're inviting the light of God in your heart, and darkness cannot coexist with light. Amen. When you invite the light of the Son of God into your heart, it expels the darkness. Amen. Then he gives you supernatural strength to resist. Now, I've got news for you. I won't tell you everything now, but friends, I told you I grew up an atheist. I was on drugs. I drank. I learned how to do it in this city with my parents. I learned how to use drugs with my mom and drank with my father. And uh, by the time I was a teenager, I was pretty heavy into it. And it was the grace of God, the power of God in me that gave me the strength to resist those things. Amen. He can give you victory where you can have real peace and happiness. And the wonderful thing is freedom. You don't have to be a slave of the devil anymore. Amen. And so many people are captive to the devil. He can set you free. But you've got to submit to him if you're going to have the strength to do that. Number 11, how did Jesus fight the assaults of the devil? Answer, Matthew 4, verse 10. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, it is written by the word of God. Now, I am doing my best to emphasize for you that the power to resist the devil is in the word. Some of you might be thinking, I don't get it, Doug. I mean, it's black ink on white paper. What do you mean? That's, I'm supposed to throw my Bible at the devil? I don't understand. There is power, inherent power, in the utterance of God. Keep in mind, the Bible says the utterance of God brought the world into existence. God said, let there be. God said, and everything came into existence. You and I can't fathom that. Some of you may not believe it, but stay with me, and you're going to find out in your own soul it's true. I used to be an atheist and an evolutionist, and I got a hold of the Bible. I didn't even intend to believe it. I was reading it so I could argue with Christians. Remember, I'm Jewish. And they were so irritating. I wanted to prove them wrong. That there's power, inherent power in the Word. And as you read it, it will fortify you against the temptations. Amen. In the Old Testament, it says, Thy word I've hid in my heart, that I might not sin. Amen. In the same way it worked for Jesus with the devil, it will work for you. Amen. Second part of that answer, Ephesians 6, 17, The sword of the Spirit, which is the? Amen. The Word of God. The Word of God. In Hebrews 4, verse 12, for the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged swords. Those two edges are symbolized by the Law and the Prophets, the two witnesses of Revelation, the New and the Old Testament, however you choose to frame it. There is power in the two-edged sword, the Word of God. And you know, in New York City, I remember how we, you know, we went out on the streets and did some interviews. We'll show them to you uh, later in the week. Talking to your average New Yorkers about believing in biblical things, it's really scary how few people think there's any credibility to the Bible. We were glad that we did find some people who said, yes, I believe the Bible. But, you know, so many people in this state-of-the-art, sophisticated city think that it's ignorant to take the Bible seriously. Heard about this one dear Christian lady who was very devoted. She was riding on a subway home. Finally, just her and some sophisticated gentleman were sitting in the car, and she was reading her Bible. And he, he, he couldn't resist. He said, ma'am, pardon me, do you really believe the Bible? She looked up and said, yes, sir, I do. She continued reading. He said, do you believe like God created the world in six days? And she said, yes, I do. And he said, you mean you believe that uh, Noah prayed and the Red Sea parted and the children of Israel crossed over? And Yes, yes, I do. You believe... No, Moses prayed. That's right. Moses prayed. Children of Israel crossed over. Noah in the ark. Noah in the ark. That's right. She said, yes, I believe in Noah in the ark. And he said, do you believe the story of Jonah, that he could live three days and three nights in the belly of a whale? 
She said, I believe every word. He said, how could a man live three, di three days in the belly of a whale? What would he breed? She said, well, I don't know. When I get to heaven, I guess I'll ask him. Well, he said, but what if he's not in heaven? She said, then you ask him. <laughs> okay. So you can't take the word of God literally. Number 12. How will the final state, I'm sorry, how will the final fate of Satan resemble that of Absalom? And this is very interesting. It tells us in 2 Samuel 18, verse 17, And they took Absalom and they cast him into a great pit. Don't miss that. Then you go to Isaiah 14, verse 15, and it says, Speaking of Lucifer, Thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. He's going to the pits, just like Absalom. Number 13, will Satan ever reappear to tempt God's people anymore? Ezekiel 28, 19, never shalt thou be any more. Is that good news, friends? Amen. That there never will be temptation. I know what some of you are thinking. Some of you are thinking, no, oh, wait a second, Doug. If, if Jesus technically defeated the devil back there at the cross, then why is it that he's still actively running around? You know, I remember going to Guam a number of years ago, and uh, they, back then when I was there, the man was still alive. They had found a Japanese soldier who did not know that the war was over, who had been hiding out in the jungles. Started out, he had a partner, but the partner died several years earlier. And I forget what it was. It was like 35 years or something like that. He thought the war was still going, and he was still gung-ho to defeat the, uh, the uh, Allied powers and... Finally, they captured him, and they said, you were defeated a long time ago, but he had never given up. Someone said it's something like a bee who can keep on buzzing even after he's lost his stinger. Jesus took the venom of the devil on the cross, and he has still come down with great wrath, but if you believe in God and you give your life to him, he can give you victory over the captivity Amen. that the devil has so many people in. Now, we got a second part to this answer. Will Satan never reappear? Nahum... Chapter 1, verse 9 tells us, Affliction shall not rise up again the second time. Is that good news? Amen. You know, a little while ago, the youngest of our children of the bachelor litter both got chicken pox. And it's, you know, it's miserable, and they're so cute, and then they get the chicken pox, and they look so horrible, you know. And, then, then they, and they're miserable, they're scratching, and they're sweating, and they're uncomfortable, and you know, your heart's yearn over them. But Karen and I said, we're glad they're getting it now while they're young. Why? Because once you get it, your body builds up, your blood builds up these immunities where you're not supposed to get it again. And it's very unlikely that you'll get it again. You know, I understand that during the Dark Ages that the bubonic plague, the Black Death, was one of the most terrible things that went through Europe. One out of three people died. Can you imagine that? One out of three people died. They did not know it then, but they know now that a cure for the bubonic plague is to get a blood transfusion from somebody who was exposed to the plague yet did not succumb because their blood then developed the antibodies. You know, there's only one person who's lived in this world without sinning, and it's his blood that is the antibiotic for sin. Amen. It's the only way that we can be washed from it and saved from it and live for eternity. Sin will not rise up again the second time. We got chicken pox once. It's never going to happen again. Furthermore, if you and I should get to the kingdom, when you're reading your Bible, when Christ rose from the grave with his glorified body, did he still have the scars in his hands? Those marks remained as a reminder of God's love for you and me that the terrible experiment with sin, that rebellion, when our planet was kidnapped by this villain called the devil, what it did to God and how much it hurt Jesus, nobody will ever question his love again. Lucifer was able to succeed because they doubted God's love. There'll never be any doubt again through eternity. Number 14, how does God feel about the destruction of the wicked? Is God pleased that some will be lost? Ezekiel 33, 11. Some people think God is vindictive and he's glad that many will be lost. Say unto them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked should turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. Why will you die? You know, I can hear in that statement the Lord 
pleading that they would turn from sin. God, the Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3, God is not willing that any should perish. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish. The Lord does not want you to perish. But you know what? God's love has given you a great gift. It's called the freedom of choice. If you choose, you can resist His pleading, His providence, the way that He tries to get your attention, or you can surrender. He loves you. The devil wants to destroy you. The devil is a bamboozler. He will do everything he can to promote and advertise and paint sin as something attractive, where in reality, it's fatal. You know, I live most of the time in Sacramento. Right across the mountain, we've got uh, Reno. A little further down, you've got Las Vegas. And those cities are beautiful cities on the outside. The fact remains there is more addiction and heartache in those beautiful cities than any other city. Gambling addictions, sexual addictions, alcohol, drug addictions. On the outside, it's so pretty, but on the inside, there's so much misery. The devil wants it to look attractive to follow, and he wants the world to look pleasing, but it's a lie, friends. I tell you, I did everything the world had to offer, and I was a miserable slave. I'll tell you more about it. Saturday morning. I hope you're able to come. But I want you to know that if you want to have real freedom in real life, it comes from allowing the Lord to move into your heart, to Amen. shed His light there. Number 15, how did David respond when he learned that his rebellious son Absalom had been slain? Some of the most moving words in the Bible. It says, the king was, you read in 2 Samuel 18, 33, and the king was much moved. How did Absalom die? You know how the rebellion in Jerusalem and Judea stopped? The son of David died, pierced in the heart, suspended between heaven and earth. Do you know what the solution for sin is? Jesus, the son of David, died, broken heart. They pierced him with a spear too, didn't they? Suspended between heaven and earth. Do you see why we use these historicals to teach these principles? Absalom, that beautiful son, died. Jesus became sin for you and me. He took the punishment. And David loved that son who wanted to destroy him. The Bible says God is love. God loves every one of you. Even if you don't love him, he still loves you. It's unconditional love. The Bible says there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. He loves you desperately. He died for you even before you knew how much he loved you. And David had that unconditional love for Absalom, even though Absalom wanted him dead. When he found out his son was dead, the Bible says he was much moved. And he went up to the chamber over the gate. The soldiers are coming in victorious, and they can hear the king crying and weeping. And he went, as he wept, he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would God I had, say it, died for thee. Oh, my son Absalom. Makes tears come to your eyes when you think about the love of that father for his rebellious son. Do you think that David loved Absalom more than God loves you? God loves you infinitely more. Amen. You know, being a pastor, part of my job description is I still do funerals. I do weddings. I don't do very many weddings because a lot of girls are superstitious about having the name bachelor signed on their marriage certificate, <laughs> which is okay with me. But funerals are hard. Sometimes I do them for babies who died from crib death. One of the hardest I did was for a 13-year-old boy. had a heart attack one day. No drugs. They had no idea of a health problem. And after everybody files by the casket, I had a boy the same age at the time, and it was really, really hard for me. I kept thinking, that could be my son. Finally, the family and the mother come by. And the mother threw herself on the still cold form of her son and took hold of him and would not let go and kept crying over and over again, my son, my son, my son, it's the echoes in my mind. Family had to pry her fingers off of her boy and bring her out. And you think how much human parents love their children. How much do you think God loves his son? How much do you think he must love you and me in that he gave his son so you could live forever? What a shame if we do not take advantage of that sacrifice that the Lord has made for us to live forever. I'd like to invite John to come up, and he's going to sing a song about a peace that comes from allowing the Lord to take possession of our hearts and our minds. And I want you to pray about 
What master do you want to serve? There are only two masters in this world. You might think I'm neutral. No such thing. God says you're either with me or against me. I pray that you'll choose to be with the one who will give you that peace. Stand by. I have more to share. like this I hope you don't mind this is a seminar if I get a little churchy I am a pastor perhaps the Lord spoken to your hearts today there's a battle going on the battlefield is your heart God has cast his vote for you the devil has cast his vote against you and you've got the tie-breaking vote Jesus will stand at the door and he'll knock but he'll not force his way into your life if you'd like to say Lord I'd like to give you permission to move into my heart. You made me, and I think I can trust you. Would you lift your hand in his presence right now? Just say, Lord, I, I believe I can trust you. You at home, you can do it where you are too, around the world. Those of you in the Caribbean and Australia and the Pacific and Africa, lift your hands and say, Lord, I'm not afraid to invite you in. He's given you a free choice. He will not force himself on you. You must give him your heart by inviting him in. You have everything to gain and possibly everything to lose by putting him off, by procrastinating. Some of you are still perhaps struggling with that decision. I'd like to offer a special prayer for you right now. Could we bow our heads together? Father in heaven, I want to thank you for your presence here tonight, for the miracles that you have performed throughout this seminar and making it all possible, for the reports that are coming back from around North America and around the world of lives that are being touched and changed by the power of the word. Lord we are now entering the millennium of prophecy. All the events foretold by the fathers are coming upon us now. I pray that you will arrest our attention. The devil has us so preoccupied with the cares of this life and so thoroughly distracted that we're forgetting the priorities of seeking first your righteousness and your kingdom. Lord, as we delve into some of the mysteries of the future, I pray that we can first and foremost submit ourselves to you because we need your spirit to illuminate our minds to understand these things. Some might be struggling right now, Lord. I ask that Jesus will move into their hearts and souls and give them the victory. And I pray in his name. Amen. Friends, don't forget, our next meeting is when? Tomorrow night. One of the most important studies in this whole seminar we save for the middle of the week. Typically, our biggest attendance is weekends, but this is the most important study. It's called the Supreme Sacrifice. Fill it out. It's not too late to bring your friends. Invite your friends, invite your neighbors, your family, your enemy to come back. We still have the best yet to come. We'll see you in our next program, friends. God bless you.